important to take this collective experience and knowledge from all the different people. Well, I want you to open up your heart and understand that this is about the humanity of the world by playing music and sharing who you are through every note that you play and for sure every note that you hear. Gentlemen, the music business has evolved dramatically. Going back from the 60s and 70s when, when we all kind of started in the process, it's evolved dramatically. Can you give me, an, and we'll start maybe with Jim in the bottom. Can you, Jim, can you tell me how the music industry has, has changed and what you've seen from where you were to where we are right now? What, what uh, uh, a thing called the music industry? Yeah. Is that what you <laughs> No, they said, don't be cynical today. This is not the day to be cynical. In light of that, I would say that uh, the industry that I used to know has changed. Yes, it has changed. And try to be brief, right? So. I'll pass it on now to, no, I, I just, I, you know, it's changed in so many ways, really, but, but certain things have not changed, and I don't think they ever will, really, that, uh, uh, you know, the heart and soul of this business has always started with the musician, and there I go, I was getting ready to go, but, um, so, the whole thing is about playing music, really, seriously. Uh, Paul McCartney, they wouldn't, uh, I heard a story one time, they would not let Paul on the lot at Capitol uh, because it was right after 9-11 and the guy was really young and he didn't know who Paul McCartney was and Paul got a little upset and he said, hey man, I built this friggin' building. And uh, it was true, basically, you know, Capitol Records without uh, Paul McCartney, you know, the Beatles. So, um, it's, it's always, it was always was the heart and soul was the musician and it still is today even though uh, it's free for people. Uh, they used to actually pay us, uh, which was nice, but uh, I feel really badly for the, for the youngsters that are coming up uh, because they don't have the, the great thing that we, that we had. They'll never have that. That'll never happen again, is that right? Somebody told me that. It's, it'll never happen again that you can have a career and raise a family, buy a home, you know, and all of that, yeah. just by playing music. I'm sorry, that sounds very cynical, and I did it, and I didn't want to do it. <laughs> That's why he asked you first. Anyway, so. <laughs> your, point, your point is well taken. You know, so being... I present to you uh, Steve Lukather, one of, the, uh, <laughs> one of my closest friends, and uh, he was told not to curse today, and I'm, I'm hoping that he. Oh, wait a minute, that, right? who am I sitting next to here? <laughs> I have the great honor of calling these two guys my very dearest friends. I mean, we've been through so much together. 44, almost 44 years yeah. I've been playing with these guys. And I was the kid then. You were 19 when we first yeah. worked. Yeah, And yeah, has it changed ever? But everything changes, you know? When they made sheet music, you know, oh, it was gonna put all the musicians out of business when they put records, forget about radio, everyone was gonna get paid. Yeah, I think right now, honestly, we're in an interim period of change. I think it's like we've gone from the old paradigm to paradigm to now, and we have to relearn and figure out how to monetize it better. The days of us walk showing up and just seeing our trunks in the hallways, going, "Oh, Lee and Jim is here. We're gonna have a great day today," yeah. not knowing what we were gonna do. No rehearsal, no demos, nothing. Sometimes not knowing who the artist or what style of music it was. That's what we did. That's not gonna happen ever again because they pulled the money out of making records. Once the suits figured out that you can make a record at home for $40 instead of $400,000 with a bunch of really great musicians in a great studio with world-class microphones and, and uh, have the time to be able to experiment and so sign somebody for four records, that's not gonna happen. They want one great song next. So it's a lot harder for a young musician to develop a long-term career for 40 years. That's the hard part. I don't know, I don't know what to say, my son, He's 32 years old. He's been, you know, working 20 years, and he's w working on his first album with his band right now. He's been doing sessions and touring with other players. But the money that they used to pay, this, this like, if you play in a club, it's 100 bucks. It was 100 bucks, what, 45, 50 years ago? Yeah. You know, you know, it was bad enough that writing songs where you get a penny, and now they want to cut that to a one one hundredth of a penny. I mean, yeah. geez, you know, who gets the other 99 cents? You know, it's crazy. That's not fair, but so we have to change with the times and figure out what the next move is. And I think that everybody's confused and we're in this, maybe in the next five years we can figure out how to, everybody gets paid and everybody's fair. Also, DJs, DJs have taken a lot of live music away from musicians to yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. When, when I was young, there was a lot of 
demo sessions. There was uh, showcase gigs and clubs to play in. Every, you get a gig and play every week with different guys and people come see you, you might get discovered. Where do you play now? I don't know, it's really difficult. I'm sure it's really difficult for the young people and you're trying to find a gig. A lot of great players, but where do you play? So I feel bad for you in that area. I don't know, Lee, why don't you give your perspective? I think you, you'll play just because you love it. When I look at it, I, I, I think back to the days of when there were labels, and that, that's pretty non-existent for the most part. Now everything's kind of independently done. Somebody has a friend who's made some money in IT, and he's ha always had a thing about wanting to be somehow connected to the music business, so he'll, he'll cut a check to go in and make a record. You know, and there's, every phone call starts with, we have a budget issue. Of course, yeah. you have a budget issue. Life is a budget issue at this point. But in, in yeah, meanwhile, in, the guy's got his like you know private plane in the yeah, driveway. Yeah, oh man, course, I can only give you a hundred bucks, man. Yeah, but but in the days of the labels, you kind of knew you were going to get maybe screwed a bit. But there was a process in in place through the labels that when you when you recorded, they they got it on the radio. They, they got airplay for you. Things got out there. The thing I find the hardest now is I've worked on some great records, you know, little indie, indie projects. I, I go to somebody's house and end up putting bass on a, on a track for them. And the stuff is great, but then when it's all done, they don't know what to do with it. That, and that's really the yeah, biggest yeah. problem right now is getting distribution out there for your work. And I'm really not sure. I mean, there's formats and stuff with Spotify and all these different things, but like the guys have said, we, we were able to, to monetize this so that we could focus on our music and not have to do other jobs. And now it's really, it's really difficult to, to find that opportunity to have this become your gig. It's your passion, but making it your gig is really the hard part. I mean, I feel really blessed, and I know these guys do too, to, to still, after, for me, after a half a century of this, to still be getting calls and working. And I feel I'm you know, one of the rarity in, in this business because I know so many great players that are just scuffling trying to get work and it's real frustrating when you do clinics and master classes and you got a room full of really hungry, gifted musicians yeah. that should be out there and yeah. you know, they're kind of, it's a little, you're kind of impotent. Paul, what would you say, Paul Quinn, Entertainment lawyer, you've got many, many clients that come to you and young kids with recordings and albums and individual musicians. What would you say about this part of the music industry? Well, first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sitting up here as the uh, imposter amongst a sea of legends. I, I will say, however, Legumes. And, and although um, I'm not wearing a suit, although I may be described as one of the suits, but just so you know, I only represent musicians, so hopefully I'm on the right side of wearing a suit and everyone needs the suit once in a while. Okay. Um, Everything they said is, of course, com completely accurate and, and completely true. And it is, a, it is a different playing field for young musicians coming up now than it was when Jim, Luke, and Lee were young. Um, but there are some things that have, have always been the same in the music industry. You know, I mean, right back to Louis Armstrong signing his first deal and up through everybody else, there was always money in the music business. Someone was always getting rich. It just frequently was never the creative person that actually made the music. And that has been a constant from, if you were signing major la label deals in the 70s and the 80s, you know, not many people know, but the band were actually usually asked to split about 12%. That was the standard deal, and out of that, they'd have to play the producer. So, you know, you're talking about selling a, mi a million records before you recoup and get paid any more money. Things have changed um, w with, with the internet. The, the people that are now being gouged by our, in, by our system the most are songwriters and session musicians. Those are the ones that come off worst. But I don't want and you producers. to... Yeah, well, it depends how you define producer. Record right? producer. Record producers in terms of what we understand you to know, be having producers. a job as a record producer. Just that's your job. Yeah, yeah. You're not anything else. There are so many kids out here, and you will run into it, Nam, who describe themselves as producers. Just because yeah. you own a laptop I'm and with you. Okay, garage right. band does not make you a producer. I, I have had that conversation more times Sorry. than you can believe. You are right. But I, I want to I tell you some numbers. Because t for those people that say the music industry or the music business or the ability to make money in music is over, someone is still making money. If you look at the numbers for 2019, um, 
The three major labels in the United States made $14 billion in revenue, more than a billion dollars a month. Eight billion of that was from streaming, and for the first time there were more, more than one trillion streams in the United States. The UK is often a good country to look at um, because it's similar and smaller and the numbers are often easier to, to digest. But in uh, 2018, 19, excuse me, music fans spent 1.85 billion on recorded music. Um, 1.32 billion of that was for streaming music. Here's the concept that, that is, is awful. While the labels have always taken a majority of the money, and that's clear, the deal that they make with the streaming companies only really works to the disadvantage of the musicians and the artists and not the labels, and I'll tell you why. The number of people that pay, how many people pay for premium Apple, premium Spotify, premium something, you know, so they're paying $10 a month or whatever it is to get streaming services. Well, the revenue generated from that $10 from people far exceeds the revenue that was available when records and CDs were originally being sold. Because more people do that, $10 a month, than they spent on records. So there's more money. These are record profits for the record labels. So the question we address is how do we redress the inequity and where is all that money going? Well, we know where it's going, right? But how do we redress the inequity? We're we talking politics or music. <laughs> it's all the same thing, I think, Luke. And in fact, it's, it's always a mistake, I think, to look at um, the music industry as existing in isolation of the outside world because what we have is massive contraction. We have uh, um, uh, more and more monopolies forming as young people who have a laptop and a, and a degree and, and they um, know what they're doing and they want to start a label. If they're successful, or a management company, if they're successful, it's just a matter of time before they're bought out by one of the majors. And so we end up with a system where there is so much leverage against us, the musicians, and the people that represent the musicians, that it becomes very, very hard to move forward. But having said that, all that negative stuff, because it's true, and I think... No, wait a minute, man, I gotta interrupt here. See, yeah, the, all right. the major labels bought into Spotify in the back door. 100%. So much so that Sony had to send, they didn't realize that when they bought in, that every artist was gonna be a shareholder. So when they went public, 100%. they had to panic and they had to pay out. So they figured out, oh, we got to get out of this so they don't have to pay us anything. Well, but, but also, so I got a billion streams with my band. I'm going, where's the money? Yeah. And they go, oh, we paying you. And yeah, they said, sue us. So we sue them. And they go, well, they give us some chump change settlement. And I'm like, what? The? They go, sue us again. They don't care. There's no staffs at these things. They're printing money. They've never made more money in their lives. 100%. And they deserve to give it to some of the guys that create the content. That's my feeling. And they're all going wrong. A hundred percent. I agree with you 100%. <laughs> understand, understand something. I sorry, I wasn't supposed to swear. Understand something. That's going to go well um, here, huh? Look what there is. is <laughs> look what there is very committed. He's a he's a man of commitment and passion. So what you're hearing is look deeper into what he's saying and the feeling of the frustration that even these great musicians as you will have. That's what the object is here to learn. One other point. When you signed a record deal in the 70s or the 80s, it was in perpetuity for life. So you can't really renegotiate anything. They own you for life. Yeah. And that's kind of weird. Yeah. Don't you think? Absolutely. Considering? Absolutely. And uh, any other business that you have to audit every two years and find lots of money, that's a breach of contract, except in the music business. Correct. So they keep writing laws to save themselves and push the content makers because they don't really want long careers anymore. That means big advances and things like that. It's all this throwaway music and like one song and go away. Yeah. It's just weird. Lee. How do you make money like that? Well, also, one of, one of the, the, I mean, the, the, we're going to find a real positive spin on all of this stuff, yes, too, today. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, 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 but another one of the aspects of this is, is like with the union now, they're, they just sent out notices that for those of us that have been doing this long enough to be on our pensions, they're going to start reducing our pension that we've paid into time out because be, wait you guys got to hear this what no so they're going to reduce the pensions because there's not enough work being generated through the union to sustain the pension fund so now all of a sudden like in the next year they, they start they, they sent me a thing that said here's going to be your reduced rates after doing this for 50 years and paying into the pension fund 
the, all of a sudden now they're going, well, you know, none of these young guys, nothing's going through the union. They're all doing it independently. Nobody's joining. No, nobody's joining. So there's nothing financing right. where you have SAG and AFTRA and they, they just making money hand over fist with these and everybody who's an actor and stuff, the, the solvency is incredible. But we had a lot of corruption in the musicians union for many, many years, mismanaging all the money we put into it. Special and all of a sudden they're, you're the victim now at the end of this. It's, it's like the government you know, talking about social security like it's a gift to you, where it's something you've it paid. All. That, all that money is your money. Wait a second, you guys wanna get a wake up call? Right, I played on a few records for the last 40 years, right? Now if you're in TV film, you get a better Pension. If you just do records, which is 99% of what I did, um, I get $1,000 a month taxable in my tax bracket, which is 53%, and they want to cut that after paying, taking percentages of my checks for 44 years. Like Lee said, that's... Now, you worked on television and film, so you got a little better deal. You too, Jim, right? So you said something a minute ago about uh, everybody having a, a laptop as a producer, right? Well, they think. I, I mean, think it's, it's, it's a... It, well, Mike Huckabee had a base. Potentially they could but, be, but... But let me say... <laughs> let, let me say this. <laughs> let, let me say this. You got to get a... Uh, uh, what do you call it? A desktop, you know? <laughs> I thought that would be funny. That, that's what I have. And so I'm a producer because of that. But here, but, but this is my point. There's a little artist named Billie Eilish. I don't know if y'all, everybody knows, right? Yeah, yeah. This little girl and her brother had the laptop, and look what they've done. So really, somebody said it a minute ago, but to, uh, both of you said it, I think. You know, there's no, there's no real difference in now and back in the day. There's always gonna be people who, with their love, their passion for the music, yeah. they're going to rise. Yeah, the cream. And it doesn't matter about you know pensions and unions and although I will say you should join the union. 100%. Uh, that's I mean his that's, point that's was a, after 50 years, give me a break. You know what I mean? Yeah, you I mean if any business yeah. for 50 years and you paid into a pension, they right. go, hey, I know it's time, but screw you. you know, that's not fair. If I didn't Changing have, the rules. if I hadn't joined the union as a kid when I was 18 and then had the, the good uh, fortune to have people like Hal Blaine and Earl Palmer, uh, who, were, who were the greatest drummers, you know, uh, they, they, to ever make records. Those guys uh, befriended me, and Shelly Mann also, God bless his soul. Uh, those guys would meet me in the hallway in the studios, and they would say, they'd grab my arm and they'd say, you doing any dark dates, Jimmy? And I would lie like crazy and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm I'm doing all union dates, you know, and then I'd feel real guilty. And so just by that thing alone, I started making sure that my name was on contracts. And I'd tell people, it has to be union, otherwise I can't do your gig. And because of that, today, that's a big part of, you know, what allows me to have freedom to, to uh, not worry about not doing as many sessions as I did before. So it's really, really important for you to be, to join the union. And, and I don't know if there are any Republicans here right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm part Republican at this time of year. Whew, boy. Uh, but I will say this, uh, you know, we, we have to get rid of this Jets versus the Giants. We're all together in this thing. We're all together. This is our government. This is our country. This is our music. This is, you know, this belongs to us, man. And we, we've got to fight for it. And I think I'm beginning to see more and more that that's what it, that's what it really is going to take for us to get in control again or, or get in some, some kind of control that they used to say, right? They talk about the founding fathers all the time. The founding fathers wanted us to be in charge, not paid politicians, not career politicians who are getting rich by staying in office and using their every power they have to just make sure that they get reelected. They're supposed to be doing creative, wonderful things like solving these problems about pensions and union and corruption and stuff within our, you know, within our government. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just didn't want them to talk about it, and now I'm doing it. Okay. Let me, let me uh, ask this question. So, but... Let me, let me ask this. Hang on one second. Back in the early 20s, in the movie industry, a lot of the... I remember. A lot of the actors... <laughs> a, lot of the actors a lot of the actors and actresses were paid a fee they were, they were put on salary. Yeah. 
and they had absolutely zero percentage in the movie that it was made. Then two gentlemen got together, Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks Sr., and they organized what's called United Artists. They were artists that put together, and they started to pay the artists a percentage, not only a fee, but a percentage of what they made. And they helped the artists make money because they realized that if we empower the artists, they will give us more art. Mm -hmm. That's what we're missing right now. Are we at a point now in the music industry where we need to put together a collective team to put together united musicians and do the same thing? Are we at that point right now? Is it possible? Could it work? The problem is there's so many musicians, upcoming musicians, you know what I mean? I'm talking about the, the, the gentlemen like yourself and people that are really understand the music industry, like Douglas Fairbanks Sr. These guys were all really... Well, I think the biggest problem with record labels in general is that musicians don't run them. I mean, if you're the head of a hospital, you're the most experienced doctor. You're not the accountant for the doctors. So can you know, we do you that now? You kind of have a hands-on, I've lived through this. Would no, no, that operation doesn't go that way. Right. If like you're a real musician, now regardless of your taste in music, you still have an idea, some idea of what's good and bad. Even though taste is involved, but it depends on where you're working and what style of music you're working in, you would be, you would know that field. So yeah. for me, there's, that's what's missing. So Lee? Well, I think one of the, the real issues that I've found with, with everything, when you were talking about well, it, it, when we started this discussion of what's changed, I think the technology changed in such a way. I mean, when we were first getting, getting started, it was LPs, you know, and if somebody came to your house and heard a record in your collection and said, oh, I love that record, they would go to Wallach's Music City or one of the record stores, and they would buy that because that's the only way you could experience that that product was to have your own copy then when cassettes came along you might be able to like burn one generation of it before it really turned to crap but when CDs came along suddenly people were like just burning like crazy and sending them up so the, the monetary side of that was over but I think what it did is is like Jim said, like when we used to show up at the studios and you'd look in the hallway and there would be like all these cases out there and you'd go, oh God, you know, Luke's on the date, man, we're gonna, we're gonna have a ball, you know, we're, this is gonna be great. Or you'd finish a session and you'd walk across the hall to another studio. I mean, that's how the first time I got to work with Herbie Hancock was because of that, because I was doing a session at A&M in, in Studio B and I walked out in the hall and Herbie was there and he said, what are you doing after, what time do you finish? I said, five, he says, I just rolled my gear across the hall and ended up doing a session with him. Those days are gone because yeah. those studio experiences are gone. The studios are busy, but they're busy on a more subdued level. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the situation that we grew up in is gone at this point. Uh, there's tons of great musicians out there, tons of great writers and artists. Uh, I did a project a couple of years ago where there was a songwriting contest that the Guitar Center put on and um, this kid, um, Josh Doyle, won it. And his, his first prize, John Shanks was the engineer. I just saw him coming in. Yeah, um, and it was one of these projects where this guy, I think his, his prize was like a three song EP and it was me and Dean Parks and I can't remember who was playing drums on it. But this guy was so good that we just said, let's just do an album. And we just stayed on our time and did the guy's record because the music was so good and had to be heard. It's, it's just, it's, it's really, it, it really frustrates me to death when I hear like really gifted young artists and they can't get the break where the labels used to sign a lot of people and they, and they would sign people not knowing where it was going. Bonnie Raitt had so many records before Nick of Time and as soon as that hit, then the whole back catalog sold. So they were willing to invest in her over a long that's period of time. That's the key, I think. And it's gone. Labels or anything, live investing in new talent, investing in a career, not just a song. You can't yeah. have a one hit song and go on the road. Nobody's gonna pay 35 bucks to hear you play one song and 30 others that you've never heard before. Yeah. So building a catalog used to be, you get signed for three or four records and they built, as long as you were moving upward, they re-up you. Yeah. But now they just want instant money. It's like instant gratification. I think maybe the People don't have an attention span. There's no A and R staff. There's no artist development. Yeah. You know, a lot of people start this great raw talent, but it needs a little time to grow. It, it needs, needs a little to be money. nurtured. Yeah. You know, uh, Mo Austin, man. Mo, yeah, those the, kind of the people. Great Mo well, Austin. well, the days, the Lady days of Walker, all those, those guys. Joe Smith just passed. 
You know, it was it was those guys in the Amish Erdogans, these guys yeah. who had a passion. Soulful about guys, music. soulful yeah. men who 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 took it like what you just said, took a chance with people like Randy Newman and Ry Cooter and Bonnie Ray, people like that, and and a lot more artists. Well, I mean, it was more about music than the bottom line. Yeah. stock yeah. stuff. They knew the That's money. The problem. They knew the it money would so be there. became so corporate, right? That you know the. the the passionate people about music got edged out and the accountants and lawyers came in yeah. to where creative people should be. Right. Just because it's the bottom line, we got to make the I'm quarterly so not go up or whatever. So the yeah. music... Pull me. Huh? I don't know if we're drifting off from where That's we right. wanted I'm, I'm to I'm going to reel you back in. So the music of the last part of the 20th century, where it, it made it a wave that's continuing today, you guys had mentors, people that you looked up to that influenced you. I want to hear who those mentors are, mentors are, and I'd like to hear, do you now have the responsibility of being a mentor to someone else? Yes. Jim, mentors that you had and, and, and some people that you're, you're oh, influencing Oh man, I now. can't even begin to talk about the mentors I had. Uh, uh, the, the first one probably really was Hal Blaine and, and Earl. Uh, Hal I could talk to because he was this nice Jewish man who was kind of like your uncle, you know, you could go up and he would give you a hug uncle. and everything. Right. <laughs> Earl Palmer was dangerous, you know, he always had a cigarette dangling from his mouth and, and he'd look at you like, don't bother coming over here. And I wanted to go over there so bad, I said, Earl, uh, but uh, eventually, you know, I made him laugh when I'd tell him that because we became really good friends. But people like that, like Hal Blaine, Earl Palmer, uh, Don Randy, uh, my first boss, uh, you know, Don, uh, people like that. Uh, Bernard Purdy's in the audience. I, no way. I, 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 dis I, uh, I discovered Bernard Purdy uh, Bernard. Uh, in the car one day. I was, I was driving the car, and this song came on, and I, I absolutely started crying. And, uh, and later on, I told Jeff Picaro about it. I said, I said Jeffrey, you got to hear this, because I was always telling him, but listen to Jim Gordon playing on this record, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that record, and so forth, John Guerin and all that. Yeah, I said, yeah. listen to this cat. Who is that? I said, his name is Purdy Purdy. <laughs> and, you know, the rest is history. Rosanna and everything else. But, um, Babylon yeah, you remember that. Yeah, well, that was, Jeff was very influenced by Bernard. Love Bernard. Yeah. We all love Bernard. Who doesn't love Bernard? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so many, so, so, just so many mentors. If you, I, I, can't, I can't begin to name all, all the people who mentored me. And so, yeah, for that reason, I try to do what I can for people, you know. Uh, people say I mentored Jeff Porcaro. But I mentored him by telling him, don't pay attention to me and what I'm doing. And I pointed him to the people to listen to, and he took my advice. That's when I knew I was, I could, I could give some good advice, you know. Well, you're very humble. Knowing Jeff, who I met in 76, he looked up to you and was appreciative to everything that you did because the advice that you gave him, the way you played, the commitment Absolutely. of every note is yeah. why Jeff played every note out of deep passion. Jim, well, that's he because was, of you. It, Jeff Percaro was, uh, was a very... That's <laughs> right. That's right. Jeff, Jeffrey Re Porcaro was uh, a very, very soulful young man. He died at the age of 38. Uh, and so all those wonderful things he did before that, uh, it just proves how soulful he was. He was, he was always an old soul. Yeah, no. He seemed to be older than me, and he was my younger brother. But he seemed older to me. He j you know, people just naturally looked up to him. And, and the way he played, it just shows it. I mean, it's, it's all on record, you know, so, you know, that... Anyway, I, I don't know about mentoring other than, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it is a responsibility. And I, and I take it seriously. I, I love to I help as many people as I can. I remember something you told me when I first met you. You know, when things were starting to happen, I started make to make clean. my, be, my, my way up, and you know, Jay Graydon and Rittenauer and um, you know, uh, Dean and Ray Parker Jr. and stuff, they're the guys I was sitting next to. And I, and I walked up to him on a session, I said, man, because he recommended me, he recommended me for some, and you recommended me for so much stuff when I was young. I said, how do I pay this back to you, man? And I'll never forget this. You said, you gotta pay it forward, man. You gotta do it for somebody else. I never forgot that, and I've always believed in helping other musicians get work. Yeah, that's, that's what that's, we can that's do. That's key. Pay it forward. That's what you gotta do. So, Steve. 
Steve, talk about the guys that, that you drew from, your mentors, teachers, people that you Well, I mentioned, from. like, Jay Graydon really took me under his wing early on, and we're still soul brothers to this day. You know, he was moving, and what would happen was, like, you know, guys would get, you know, become session musicians, work their way up, to, and then they would move on to being a producer or an artist themselves. And that was, like, a 10, 12-year period, and it would make room for another group of guys to kind of move in, and that was what it was. Every t 10, 15 years, a new crop would come in, and guys would either retire or they'd be artists or they're producers and move on. But now that doesn't happen. There's not that pecking order of like even in the old days you used to be able to do 20 bucks a song or something, learn how to work in the studio doing demos and stuff like that, sort of the minor leagues. But there's like, if you go from your living room to like, I, want, I gotta be number one or nobody will talk to you. There's no stepping stones to get, can I just get here and move here and pay the dues and get the experience? You have to be instant record yourself. You have to make everything yourself and get a lot of people to listen to it for a label will even look at you. So that's not fair. I think you really need to... So I swore there, again, I'm sorry. Are there younger... We have a jar on the back for every time he curses. That's gonna be my retirement. Can I just leave a credit card? Give me the money right now. Just give whatever you got of it. Steve, so who do you see as, as young players that, uh, because, and, and I've, for years you've always done this, you've always seen young people and you've given them tremendous encouragement. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, my son, I've been helping out a lot. He's 32 years old now, I'm making a living playing music, you know, and that's hard, but he also has a girlfriend who has money too, so. It's like, here's the old joke, you know, what do you call a musician without a girlfriend? Homeless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lee, who, who, do, who would you go back as far as people that mentored you, who influenced you, and then do you see yourself with that responsibility? Um, when I, start, I started as a pianist when I was five, and when I was 12 I, I changed over to bass because the school needed a bass player and they had like 50 piano players. And I, I, I started on upright and then I started listening to Ray Brown and Charlie Mingus and Red Callender and, and all these great upright jazz players and tried to kind of eke what I could out, out of them. Uh, like so many of us, when the Beatles hit the scene, my life changed dramatically. But I kind of like, in terms of early, early influences, to me, almost everybody that picks up that instrument is going to do something unique, and I kind of draw from everybody, and it doesn't have to be like some chops monster. I, I, you know, I, I love Jamerson, I love Bob Babbitt, I love Carol Kay, I love so many of these, these players, and, and I, I would shamelessly sit in, in, at home and play along with LPs and, and try to learn all these parts. And, and, fig and then when I would, started doing sessions, I'd kind of had this Rolodex in the back of my head of all these great parts that all these people had done and try to put my own spin on them. Yeah. Uh, at, at th and, and I remember doing sessions where I, I'm, I'm deeply aware of my own limitations and I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And when I, I, I remember doing one project and they wanted me to play upright on it. And I'd been away from upright for years and it's not riding a bicycle. You don't just get back on it and you're, you're right back where you were. Yeah. And I just felt really inadequate, even though I had a, an, an upright bass, I thought. And so on this one project I was doing, I said, look it, I've got a Washburn AB45 that I pulled the frets out of, and it's a five-string. And, and Ahmed Erdogan was producing it. And I said, here, let me just try this and see what you think. And, and I played, and he goes, I love that sound. We'll use it. But two tracks came along on this project that I thought, no, it really needs upright. And it was when Patitucci still lived in town. And I said, look it. Call John, I'm off the clock right now. Because to me, the ultimate thing is what's best for the project. And if, if there's a guy that I think is better than me, I have friends, like I'm a shitty slap player. And I've got friends that are monsters that, that live and breathe this. And if I get called for one of those sessions, I'll say, call this cat. He's, he's the guy, you're gonna be so thrilled with him. It's gonna be perfect. Rather than me coming in faking it and being kind of embarrassed, it may work at the end of the day, but it's too traumatic. You and know, Jeff was just exactly Jeff was like exactly that. like yeah, he would Jeff. call. He would call. I'd get a call. I'd be eating dinner with the family, and I get a call. Say, Yo, Jimmy, come on down to Sound Factory. And I said, well, What's going on? What, what's happening? They're they're playing this song. I can't do it. I can't. I, I can't. It needs you. <coughs> okay. 
Jeff, what are you talking about, man? No, he would do and, that. I know. No, I was on I dates where he, with I'd him. I go down he there, and and it, it just was for me. It was a great chance to hang with my with my brother. I I loved him so much. Yeah. But he was like that, and that's very rare. And Lee is like that, and I don't know. I don't think they make them like that anymore. Well, it, but it's, they, everybody's kind of covets. When work becomes limited, everybody starts coveting that yeah. that work rather than saying, "Oh, I got enough work. I'd, I'd really rather spread the wealth out as 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 it goes." Now, one of the problems I have is like kind of being an ins an insomniac really opens you up to a lot of YouTube. <laughs> but I, I sit there and I, and I watch a lot of these videos of young cats because I think about, we always talked about receiving the baton and passing the right. baton. And the only way I've really done it is to comment on this because I see so many videos and, and, of bass players and they're all chops related. It's, there's, I say, and I'll write in and I'll go, I don't see anybody posting a video about crafting a bass part to a song. I see somebody, you know, doing unbelievable amount of, of dexterity things on it, but there's nothing touching me here. It's all, all this. And I, I try to encourage guys to just, I said, a whole note can be a, an adventure. You know, I mean, it's, if you've got your chops up and playing 30 second notes and doing all kinds of stuff, it's fine. But if you've been given a whole note or a half note to play, how are you going to approach that? And none of, nobody does that. And, and it's like, I was blessed enough to do Spectrum with Billy Cobham. And one, and, <laughs> but, but, but one of the things on that was when, when we did Stratus, the reason that that song worked was tension. And like when I did the bass part on it, it never moves from that one lick. It just sits there. And every time I look at anybody's videos of it, after about eight bars, they're starting to throw all kinds of them and doing all. And I said, and they completely lose what the essence of what that song was about. So my mentoring side is just trying to encourage people to listen to songs, understand how to craft parts for songs. And I hear some amazing musicians. I mean, it's just sh shocking, you know. Yeah. Sometimes you see. They'll, they'll pull up something of like a little eight-year-old kid playing bass, and I'm going, are you kidding me? <laughs> I saw a fetus that can play like Stevie Ray Vaughan. <laughs> it's astounding. Little mini strat, you know. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. We have, you know, Paul, you coming, you coming from England and living in England and then, and then making your way over here. What was it like, gentlemen, where there was a date in the history of the music industry the Ed Sullivan Show, which was an evening talk show and, 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 and a variety show that had different acts come on, whether they were jugglers and dancers and musicians. February 9th of 1964. Did this evening, February 9th of 1964, did that evening when the Beatles hit, did that affect you guys in any way? Oh man, life went from black and white to color like yeah. the Wizard of Oz, ironically. Uh, yeah, that changed, life-changing event. What do you Everything think was, changed. My what life. Was it, what was it about that performance and, and that, that little black and white? Too? What was it about that that reached you? It didn't reach just me. The whole planet. Yeah. You know? yeah, I mean, absolutely. it was a life. I mean, it changed the world. It was that an moment. energy and a, and a vibe about the whole. I was an usher at the Hollywood Bowl when the Beatles played there. I got to hear them live. Wow. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, man. I actually got close enough to the stage where I could actually hear them. Wow. You know, it, was, <laughs> it was deep. It was, it was deep. You know, I, really quickly, uh, I, I got to tell you, I have to say this now, because especially after what you guys just said. I have to tell you, and my wife is out there, and she's going to go, oh, God, he's going to say that. Uh, uh, when they, that night that you're talking about, she hollered at me. I remember that. That's how powerful it was for me. She, I remember her hollering at me, hey, Jim, come here. You got to see this. And I went and I took a little quick look and listened and I said, what? And she said, well, you got to watch this. And I said, ah, that's a bunch of, and I won't say what I called it. And it's, I told, we're not supposed to. right, I, I just didn't pay attention to that at all. They did not touch me in any kind of way. Jazz snob. And I was the jazz <laughs> snob. If it wasn't Coltrane or Miles, I was not interested. I'm sorry. And I told that to John years later and George, and they loved it. <laughs> They love that. So in music, Paul, what was it like when, when you're living there and when, when they hit the scene? How old do you think I am? <laughs> um, hey, wait a minute, man. Yeah. I am... Uh, um, this is the lawyer for the fetus. 
I, yeah, I would, yeah, I'm the lawyer for the fetus. I should be, frankly. Uh, I do want to say that maybe, you know, if, if those of you that are familiar with the artist series interviews that Dom does, I think Leland may have just revealed why his has 250,000 views if he spends all night up on YouTube. So, um, uh, uh, more, more watches of Lee's video than anybody else uh, uh, on, our, on our channel. But I was born in 1964. So, uh, um, and I know, sorry. Um, but being raised between Manchester and Liverpool, the truth of the matter is we all listened to the Beatles in private and it wasn't cool to like the Beatles in public when you got wow. into the 70s because they were like the local guys that people were, were like, ugh. You know, but we all went home. I, I have four older sisters, so I have every Beatles record on vinyl from my sisters, and I used to go home and listen to it, but never tell anybody I was actually a, a fan. And I think of all the music I listened to growing up between the ages of maybe 10 and, and 17, um, I still listen to nearly all that music. I listen to James Taylor all the time. I listen to the Beatles all the time. And of course, I listen to Steely Dan because they're the greatest band of all time. And I don't care what you say. <laughs> oh, I go with you. So let's, let's go here. You know, in the, in the world now, this word that comes out in any business, but it's the brand. And each of you are a brand. You have developed into a brand. Was that ever a part of your consciousness as far as what you were thinking about, about becoming a well-known entity in this business? No. no not really. I, I, I fell into music kind of by accident. Um, I had been playing, like I said, since I was a little kid, but when I was in college, I, I did my first two years in the music department and hated it because I, I realized they only were trying to turn out music teachers and they really weren't encouraging performance. Uh, so I, I went and moved into the, I was a science and art co-majors so and I was gonna become a medical illustrator. And then I met James Taylor on, when he hung out at a rehearsal of a band. I said, God, there's the weirdest. We've got some, some sub hello, going, I hate hello, bass. Hello, hello. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> but, but when we got in the studio, I mean, I'll digress for one moment. In 1967, I was in a band called Group Therapy, and we were produced by Mike Post. And Mike Post at that time had just, had just done um, Classical Gas with Mason Williams, and he was the musical director on the Andy Williams show. Oh, I didn't know that. So we were in the studio. We were in United A, and I'd never been in a studio before, and they weren't going to let us play on our record. Um, they said, you're too inexperienced, you know, you got, we only sang, it was kind of an association, kind of a group. And, um, but I looked through the window and there's Hal Blaine, there's Carol Kay, there's Jim Gordon, there's Dennis Budimir, there's um, Rubini, Nectal, Melvoin, all three keyboard. I mean, it was, it was the wrecking crew was on the other side of this window. And I just thought to myself, not in a million years would I ever be able to do this job. I mean, these guys are just unbelievable, how they approached it and everything they did. And three years later, I was working with them every day. I mean, it just, it just fell into place. And I never really thought about legacy or anything. I've just always been really, really proud to be a part of the music community and to be hired. You know, when the phone rings at this point after 50 years, man, I still get off. I just get excited and I get anxious. I'm driving to work and I'm going, God, please don't suck, don't suck. Because <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you're going into. I mean, I, I, that was kind of the magic of the heyday for us was you'd show up at the studio, you had no idea if you were doing country, funk, jazz, a commercial, a movie. There was very little information. You just got a call from somebody and said, you know, be at United at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. Or, or then, it, the beauty of it was you would get these calls and it would be a week or 10 days in the studio. So you had this time to really experiment and evolve and make things more than a one take. You know, they were thrilled when, you, when you're looking at somebody going like this and, and you got to get eight tracks in, in, in six hours. It doesn't allow you time to really experiment with things. Uh, we were lucky in those days uh, with people like James Taylor. We were in the studio working, and uh, he had one song, and one of the background parts was, was the, the lyric was letting the time go by. But he kind of went, ah, that's, that's kind of whatever. So 
he sang it, the part, then we reversed the tape, wrote it all out phonetically, he sang the whole thing phonetically, and then we flipped the tape over, so instead of going, letting the time go by, we went, letting the time go by. I mean, it was just, it, we had the time to screw around with things and make them a little more unique than it would have been in a normal situation. So, uh, but during the course of all that, I was just happy to be a working musician, and I still am. I, I don't think about my history and, and whatever legacy, that's for other people to enjoy. When I do interviews and stuff, I think about today, and like right now I'm focused on, we're doing the Grammy pre-show next week, which is a ball, and I'm like thinking, I got like 80 pieces of music that I'm gonna have to be playing in one afternoon, and that's where my head is. It's not like thinking back to running on empty or your smiling face or things like that. That's... We'll think about those That's boys. fine, that's fine. That's, that's good. Paul. Yeah, let me. Um, I deal with a lot of up and coming musicians who ask questions about branding. Uh, and I, it is true to get the attention in this environment, it's great if you can stand out, but it's even better if you can stand out because you're actually good. I think my advice to people on branding is never contrive a brand, right? Just be who you are and allow that to create your brand. You know, um, I am, I am blessed to have a wonderful 14-year-old autistic son. I got an autistic son, nine years old. I know. Welcome to the club, brother. Yeah, well. <laughs> so, and sweetest boy in, in the whole world, but he asked, wanted to know what I was doing in LA when I came here. And so um, I showed him pictures of the people that were gonna be on the panel. And of course, his attention went directly to Leland. And Leland doesn't have that beard because he wants to brand himself. He has that beard because he has that beard. I mean, because I'm too lazy to shave in yeah. the morning. <laughs> and of course, in the, when I talked to my son this morning, and his, his only question was, have you met Dumbledore yet? Yes. <laughs> so, so it's an unintentional brand, but it works. He did not ask about Dom, who he knows. He didn't ask about Luke, and he didn't ask about Jim. He only asked about Dumbledore. So he actually has a vestigial twin underneath there. <laughs> so understand, I asked the question about branding because what I see, what I see in my travels as I travel around the world, too many people are focused on their brand as their upcoming musicians. So the point that we have here is, don't think about that. Don't just just be the best you can be and emotionally try and share that feeling so people from your instrument and from your music can be emotionally taken in. That's really what branding has to happen. We have a microphone here. If anybody wants to come up here for some questions, I want to take a couple questions from the audience. Can you say one thing real quick? Please, if you would, line up. At the I was doing a session line. years ago with Don Hanley and, and, and during one of the breaks, Don looked at me and he says, do you think Eagles is a stupid name for a band? And I said, I thought Beatles was a stupid name for a band. <laughs> I said, just and make... I win. Hey, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I win. Uh, my name is Guy James. I, uh, I'm actually from Orange County here. I live in Honolulu now. Play guitar in the Air Force Band, actually, right. out there. Um, I'm kind of curious. This might be more of a question for you, Dom, in regards to artist management and whatnot. A challenge that the young guys face nowadays uh, is the whole social media world and how people are just sitting behind their phones and their computers thinking they're getting entertained and that's like good enough for them. So people aren't showing up to concerts and there's just, you know, there's tons of shows going on, but no one's showing up. So there's no audiences. Some of the stuff you guys were talking about early on. What that is may your... be an economic thing too, because people don't have a lot of spare money across the country, you know, to go out every night and see people. So they maybe a little bit more, they choose. Yeah, but you, ha you have some advantages today. First of all, the time that people are spending on their technology myself and I think we spent on our instrument. We, I practiced a lot, put yeah. serious yeah. time into it. And more than practicing, if it's 100%, 10% was practicing, and I practiced a lot. 90% was listening to music and playing with musicians, getting together with people and playing and expressing yourself and feeling that camaraderie of, of just the feeling of like, they did something that you didn't think of it and you went with it and the feeling of that moment in the now. Mm -hmm. But you have the advantage now that you can post performances of yourself and your groups onto YouTube, you can have social media that you can be recognized that way that could create and lead you someplace. So there are advantages that you have today that for sure I did not have, that we didn't have years ago. So you have to kind of seek all those opportunities and balance them, but it's gotta have the driven passion of you playing music, putting time into your instrument, and going out and being the best you that you can be. 
Thanks so much. Great, great question. Next, yes, please. Hi, my name is Lisa Castellino. I'm from New York, but I live in LA now. I teach high school music at Hollywood High. And I, um, I try to inspire my students. I know we get, it's, it's a hard industry, but they have us because we're so passionate we can't imagine doing anything else. So I try to inspire my students just to stick with that passion and not to really focus on the money they're going to make or the fame and all that other stuff. But my biggest concern is they don't go back far enough to know where the music they love is coming from. We all have experiences. So when I tell them about some artists that I feel like they'd have to be you know, living under a rock to not know, they don't know. And it, it's, it's heartbreaking for me. So how can I inspire these students to just dig a little deeper, you know, go well, back a little bit. maybe if they have a favorite artist, they should look into what inspired that favorite artist and what inspired the favorite artist before them. Right. And you have to kind of do history. It's like the Beatles, the Stones, and the whole British invasion, you know, Beck, Page, and Clapton, those guys. We thought, as kids in the Valley, in, in L.A., that they invented this blues music. Then we heard, no, they didn't invent it. <laughs> and then we went back and got into Chuck Berry and BB, all the Kings and all that other stuff. And we went, whoa, wow. And you become your own music teacher yourself. So maybe you should try to encourage that. Like the blues yeah. Nobody knew about I do all the time. I, yeah, right. I tell them, go back, go back, go back. And there it's just like. Psh. Well, maybe it's also, I mean, yeah. in terms of what you're, what you're doing is almost archiving things to the point where you can expose them. Because the thing I found with like a, and you don't, kind of my mantra for myself is don't become an old fart. <laughs> you know, you just see, I mean, Too I want to work and I want, I know, I know, but just, just yeah. let me pinch one off. Um, but, <laughs> but, but in terms of like turning them on, turning them on to yeah. it, you know, like finding out what they like and then kind of teaching them historically, because we were just saying like, when the Blues Brothers came out, all, there was a whole lot of people that thought the Blues Brothers invented what they were doing. They didn't know about Sam and Dave. They didn't know about the whole deep history of all of that. And I remember like when Michael Jackson was being talked to about his dancing and moonwalking and all that, and then he talked about James Brown, and then James Brown had been interviewed, and he talked about Cab Calloway, mm -hmm. and Cab Calloway had talked about a guy from uh, vaudeville who he had seen that did all that stuff, and suddenly you know, footage was showing up with some guy almost in an old tin type thing, yeah. moonwalking. Yeah. It's like, it's, none of it's really new. It's just being kind of recreated. Yeah. But I, I, I value more than anything the fact that you're a teacher. Yeah, and I, I look here. back. Yeah, yeah. 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 And a music yeah. teacher. Yeah. And yeah. she's also... She's also an excellent singer, too, by the way. Okay. She sings very, very well. But Yeah, I look back to my music teachers, and I don't think I would have anything going on in my life if it wasn't for those teachers. They really opened up a Same. whole world they to me. They did to me, too. Music in schools was Same. so important yeah, to me. That's what we're losing. Would you guys be willing to come to Hollywood High and talk to my kids? Sure. <laughs> oh, my God. You got to hear. Lisa, also. I'll be Thank happy you. to. I'll write the agreement for you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. What we have done on the vision of Jules Follett is by having this, the panel sessions and the interviews. We have over 200 interviews of all of these great musicians. And the questions that I ask are questions about what motivates you, how did you learn, what were your teachers, who were your mentors, what advice can you give? And they mentioned who they were inspired by. I always tell everyone when you're watching the interview, when you hear a name that is mentioned, when you say Ray Parker Jr., stop, you say Danny Korchmar, you stop and you go back and you do the research, which you have now an advantage, which we yeah. did not have years ago. Ooh. You freaking Google the name and study it for a few minutes and get to know it. Look at what they've done, their albums, then go back to the interview and continue on. So you may have to do research of five or ten names per interview. That's how you're going to understand the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. If you can do that and watch these interviews with your students, I think you'll be on a great, great journey. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Love you guys. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you, Thanks, Lisa. Lisa. Yeah. Next, please. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Felipe. Felipe, how, how old are you? 13. 13. That's very, very good. Thank you so much for joining us. I have underwear older than you. <laughs> That yeah, he's still wearing, he's wearing it right still now. Still wearing it. Thank and you very much, Steve. <laughs> what does your question do? As a growing musician and after listening to you, it seems like now as the music business has grown, it seems like it's much harder to get around the business side, like legal yes. issues and money issues. I love that you're saying this. 
That's awesome that you're aware of that. And a lot of new players are playing too many chops, so like, what's, what's advice you can give to us? That's the well, best question. I think you can advice to us, right? Absolutely, man, for sure. You're fantastic. Okay. Gentlemen, what would you say? Go ahead. Paul? Felipe, great question. And, and you're exactly right, yes. Um, there is no amount of information out there that you shouldn't try and wrap your arms around, right? So statements like, e e let's talk about um, separate your playing from the business, even though they're not. So I, I know you, I've seen you play, I know what a great drummer you are now, let wow. alone how great you will be in 10 years, right? So I know that. But the fact that you've listened to Jim and you've listened to Lee both talk about these people that play too many chops, what a fantastic lesson to learn because that sets you apart from about 95% of the people in your age range, 10 to 17, who are on YouTube. You now already know that how do you work? How do you do the best, right? You play for the song. The business stuff right now is gonna be not too necessary for you. It's gonna be real hard for your mom because just so you know, no matter what happens to you right now, in almost every jurisdiction in the United States, no one's going to enter into a contract with you because you are rendered incompetent to contract when you're under the age of 18. So the contract will be with your mom. And, and unless you're, I, I can't even think of an example of somebody that is going to sell a billion records aged 15 because they're this, that, and the other, then, then people will enter into those deals with you. Don't worry about it but learn at every opportunity you can possibly have. The times when the money was available for you to hire personal managers, business managers, accountants, even though, you know, just so you know, the best accountant in the world is sitting right there. Just so. Um, <laughs> oh, there is Shecky. I, I, I've All got right. it. Uh, <laughs> um, but in this democratization of our industry, um, the money is often not there to do that, so you have to learn to do a lot of it yourself. Surround yourself with people you trust and people you like and take it one step at a time and you'll be good. Good luck. This, we witnessed, is an old soul. Wow. Old soul. Hi, uh, my name's John Fox. I play bass. I'm from Woodstock, New York. Living in New Jersey now. And uh, I have a question, I guess, mainly for Lee because of something you mentioned before about um, how I approach the song. Right? So, um, to me, it seems like you need, it's not just you, but you've got you've to be locked with the drummer, and there's many different ways that you can approach a particular song. So, could you talk a little bit about your process for how do you approach a song? I mean, you could be given anything from maybe a tape to maybe sheet music, maybe written out notes or chord changes, or what, what's typical. Uh, or is there a, a not, nothing typical? They're all Nothing's different. Nothing's typical. Okay, and then, uh, so how do you decide how to approach it? Yeah, it comes in, in every format from generally nothing um, to a chord sheet, to a chart, to a Nashville number chart, or whatever. The first thing you do is you listen to the song. Um, if it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm happiest if I'm working, like with, say if I was doing a Clint Black record, um, Clint would just sit down and play guitar, uh, and we would sketch out our, our own charts for the thing if, they, if nobody had, had put together chord sheets or anything. But you sit in, and, and you really, uh, uh, for me, I listen to the song and try to determine what the song wants from me. I don't impose myself on the material to show off that I'm there. Um, a lot of times I'm happiest if you're unaware that I'm there, but you'd only know I'm not there if, if you take the bass out. Uh, I, I, I just, I really just worship, I really love songs more than anything. I'm not a, a, a like last night I, I was one of the judges for a bass solo contest and there's nothing I hate worse than a bass solo. So it was like a weird, <laughs> it was just weird <laughs> for me. But, but I just, I, I'm a real songsmith so I really like to listen to a song and, and just find out where I, I fit into it. Um, and, and let it kind of dictate to me. I don't, I try not to intellectualize too much. I really pretty much real visceral. My best takes are always first, second take uh, of a song. And after that, I, I get into a different headspace and it becomes slightly more mechanical. It does. Um, yeah. But that first, that first initial gut reaction is what I look for out of things. And it, it, it's ideal if somebody has some kind of a, 
of a, a outline for the song, be it a chord sheet or something, so you're not spending that initial energy sketching out the song. You, you can look down and immediately, uh, and, and I know there's, uh, I mean, we, we saw like Al Schmidt here and Nico Bolas, and there's a bunch of engineers. That's the one thing you always want the engineer to have the machine running all the time, because sometimes the very best stuff is before you've actually started the, the official track. And you go back and go, oh God, what we did on that one, or at least you can go back and reference it. So, yeah. but it's it's it really it it really is predicated on the song. Some things are really instantaneous and just fall into place, and you know immediately. And you're also working with other guys, so you're accommodating them. I mean, if I'm working with Jim one day and I'm working with John Robinson the next day, these are stylistically two very different drummers, and, and where they sit that pocket is very very different. Or in the days when I would go from Jeff Picaro to Carlos Vega, Russ Kunkel, and, and, and people, you're kind of a chameleon. You're constantly accommodating the other players you're working with. And, and that's the beauty of guys like this, is everybody's in that headspace. So they're all looking, how can we put this together to make the best possible outcome, rather than a dig me moment in there. You have to have an arranger's mind. Like when you look at an E chord, they go, you know, and you don't just go ding, ding, E, E, E. You've got to react to what's going on around you and, and have an intuition and an arranger's mind to know, to play off of other people. And it's not something you can really go to school to learn. It's yeah. very strange. You know, let me, let me say, that's uh, back a, a minute ago when, when the teacher was talking, uh, I was going to say that. You know, certain things you can't teach. Um, you can lead them uh, in the direction that we were talking about, but uh, but there's the the individual student, like uh, the 13-year-old drummer. What's your name, babe? Felipe. The whole thing is how much you love to play. That's that's the whole deal. That's all you have to ever think about. At from the age of 13 to the age of 83, like me right now, it doesn't matter. It's still exactly the same thing. It's it's how much you love it and then you will know, like for the teacher, your kids that will want to have, they'll, they're gonna wanna know things that the others are not gonna wanna know. They're, the others are gonna be right up in here. And there's a reason for that, you know, and that's good. That's, that's, it, it really just comes down to everybody is so different, so many different needs, so many different things. And then the thing about the chops, I, I must say, I must say, because I always take the opportunity to say this, we should celebrate our brothers and sisters who have chops that are from another planet. We should yeah, celebrate absolutely. that and we should support them. Yeah. Because just because we don't necessarily, here's the way I look at that. It's not that I can't do that, which I can't. I, can't ever, I will never be able to play like Dave Weckl or, or uh, all my other, uh, Vinny or, or my really good, they're all my good friends. I've made a point of that over the years. I'll never be able to do what they do, but the point is that I don't want to do what they do. I want to do what I do. Yeah. And I want to do it better than the last time I did it. You know, that's the whole thing. Uh, so, you know, playing simply or playing complicated or whatever all that is, it, it doesn't matter. It's just like what Lee just said, it, the music really will dictate to you what you should do. And that's what you need to focus on. Yeah, it's all life experience, you know, and you just kind of tuck things away and you might find yourself in a situation on a project and something just sparks in your mind of something you heard, you know, once before. And you, and you kind of make it your own, but, um, but it worked. You know, I mean, there's a finite amount of stuff to do, you know, and, and it's like, but, you, but there really is no rules. You just, you know, th that moment is going to be what it is. And if you played that song the next day, it might turn out totally different because you're going to be totally different the next day than you were the day before, you know, so. Thank you very much. You know, one thing quickly crosses my mind is, is all the m incredible musicians that I know, the one thing they all have in common is they listen. Right, so they, they listen really carefully to what they're playing and then they use those hours of practice Don was talking about and the way their creative mind works to find the appropriate part for what they listen to. But listening, to, listening involves a lot more than hearing. So listen. You know, as a drummer, I have always 
been fascinated by the fact that there are times on, on recording sessions where I can actually feel somebody listening. I can hear somebody listening to me. And that is really, that's a, that's a great feeling. Uh, and especially when you have the conversation about it later. I, I never used to want to talk about stuff like that. But, but uh, to go back to my little brother, Jeff Pacero, he said one time uh, that at the, at the, uh, during the middle of a session, he went out to listen to see what everybody was, uh, what their headphones were, what they had in their headphones. Because on the playbacks, it wasn't grooving. And he knew, he had the self-confidence to know that it wasn't because of him. So he went out there and he checked people's headphones and then he gathered everybody back in the control room. And he said, when you guys are at your house with your little studios and you're, you've got Roger Lynn jacked up in your phones as loud as you can be, you're doing that because you don't want to get out of the pocket, right? You come to the studio and you're playing with me and you don't have me in your headphones, you have yourself in the headphones. So that was a, that was a big, that was a very eye-opening uh, Very deep, absolutely. Thing. Yeah, 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 it was. Yeah. I thought it was very bold. I thought, wow, you did that? But that's the way he was. And, uh, and, and that's, that's the key is listening. Whoever said that yeah, said yeah, that. Yeah. That's the lawyer. Yeah. And that's because yeah. it's always about the music. Thank you so much. Great okay. question. Let's Thank do a couple you. more questions. Hi, I'm John from the Philadelphia area. And my girlfriend, soulmate Kat, brought me to my first NAM show ever, so I'm completely Great. overwhelmed. And we're um, very musical, very creative people, and we want to write, record, and release music. We just invite the panel to suggest how we could do that or any insights you guys might have That's a big question. to kind of help us. That and is we, a very like I said, big we want to write and record and release music. So, um, you know, I'm a multi instrumentalist. She's a singer, keyboard player, and, you know, We've, I have a laptop. I'm not a producer. I know that, but oh, you, know, you took the credit. I threw that away. Don't take me seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we on. all have them. So yeah. if you guys, you know, maybe others have the same question, but how can we write and release music, knowing that's, you know, do you just put it out through CD Baby? There's Spotify. There's all these stuff. You know, and we know you don't get paid if you get a billion streams. I heard that. So, uh, you, you know, that's not a as much as you question, think. Is yeah. what I mean, that's, a, that's really, honestly, I. I will try and talk to you when this is over, but that's such a huge Thank question. You. I mean, yeah. there's so much to do. I, I will tell you, if I can give you, without being flip, I promise I'm not being flip, and I would sure. happily spend the time to try and give you some advice after the panel. Um, honestly, don't talk about it. Don't think about it. Just go do it. Get the product in your hand I agree. first, right? And then let's talk about what we do with the product. Right, but get Sounds the best good. thing you can have that you're proud of, that you can play to people and say, this is indicative of my soul, right? This is a little bit of me right here and I'm proud of it. And then we can decide what to do with it. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much. We have to stop the questions right now. We only have about, about 10 minutes. And in, oh this, in this closing time, we have an incredible amount of wisdom up on this panel. And wisdom is the combination of knowledge and experience. Knowledge alone does not make someone wise. Knowledge put into action, which creates experience combined, that's where wisdom comes from. Gentlemen, in this music industry we have, and, and with the incredible momentum that you guys have created and you continue to create, in closing, and I'll, Paul, I'll probably start with you, what advice would you give to this next generation with the challenges that there are in the music industry? We understand the challenges. With those challenges, how can they pursue their dreams of being involved in music and being maybe a full-time musician? There are definitely challenges, but you know what? There have always been challenges. There are definitely solutions, but there have always been solutions. I, I will suggest to you that in this environment, and our music industry is not divorced from the culture as a whole, it, it grows from it and it draws from it, that the secret to success in the future comes in collectivization. It comes with us working together, it comes with us listening to each other, and it comes from a desire for us all to succeed together. And together, I'm, I'm meaning creative people. I think earlier on we said join the union. In many states now, you're not allowed to have a closed shop union, and, and rather um, dishonestly, those laws in most states are referred to as right to work states. There's nothing we can do about that unless we can change the legislation, and, and that may be a, a, a long battle. Doesn't mean we shouldn't take it. But by working together, what I really mean is treat everybody fairly. 
If you do work for somebody, expect to be paid fairly. If they do work for you, pay them fairly. Treat them kindly. Develop an industry which is far more supportive of each other than the one that has existed before. Because when we are divided, we are weaker. And when we are together, we are stronger. And as we move forward in this industry, the only way we can really do it is together. So be kind, treat each other fairly, and when we get to the actual nitty gritty rather than the, um, you know, the ephemeral idea ideals, find the people who have the explicit knowledge that you are seeking and ask them for it. And if everybody is kind, they will answer your question. It's great. Fantastic. Great answer. Mr. Paul Quinn. Leland, same question about trying to reach these people with, with answers of motivation that can give them guidance. First off, that, that was incredible. I mean, I, you're so dead on with that. It, it's great. And, Absolutely. And, and, and another aspect of that to me is for, for young people coming along, love what you do. Just love the music. Do the music because that's what you have to do. You, you have no choice in your life. This is what your love and your passion is. And the thing with the technology I, I've, I've seen is a lot of people are like living isolated from other players. So I find drummers that can't play in, in a pocket because they've never worked with other musicians. They're only sitting home playing. Find as many like-minded musicians as you can. The greatest honor would be to be in a garage playing and the cops show up at your house because the neighbors are complaining that yeah. you're playing too loud. I mean, that was how we grew up. Everybody. Yeah. Players got together, and, and, and I remember my, my wife had a little antique shop, and the woman who had the shop next door, she had a, um, uh, her shop, and she, she asked me one day, she said, look, I have a nephew, and he's in the Midwest, and they're forming a band, and can you call him and give him any sagely advice and all this? I ended up calling this guy up, and we talked for a couple of hours, and it turned out to be Peter Buck, and they were starting REM. <laughs> So you never, you just never know what's, what's going on, but it's really, these guys were having a great time playing together and, and don't have like this sort of American Idol, the voice mentality, like you're going to go from the loading dock to superstardom overnight. Just do what you really love. And if something really comes together with it, it may find a vehicle and it may not find an opportunity. And it's frustrating, but I was tell like when I do like uh, clinics and stuff, I said, it's kind of like the Powerball where they say, you know, odds are 175 million to one that you're going to win. And the next day on TV, there's this guy or a woman standing there with their giant cardboard chair. Somebody's going to make it in this business and it's always going to move on. The odds are stacked against you. So you have to be prepared for disappointment in terms of a long term career. But to love what you do and, and have this, and I've done a lot of records that are vanity projects with people that are doctors and athletes. I did Bernie Williams' record when he was a center fielder for the Yankees, and it's, he's an unbelievable guitarist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and th these things come along that these guys, they're not giving up that passion for music, so. Yeah. Leland Sklar. <laughs> Fantastic. Steve, again, same question. Now, and you, you know, usually are a very quiet, um, you know, person. I want you to open up a little bit and let these people know what can give them a future in the music industry. I'm just coming out of my shell. <laughs> Originality, key. Everybody jumps on a bandwagon. If something, a new sound comes, then everybody sounds like that. If you find yourself sounding like other people, it's going to be harder for you. You can argue and say, well, that's what they want, that's what they, but the people that rise to the top have something a little different. They didn't walk the same path as everybody else. Great to be influenced by your favorite artists, and that can sneak into everybody's work, but dare to be a little different. It's cool to learn the notes perfectly with your favorite hero, but where are you in? You have to have yourself in it, and it has to, it has to have soul. You have to mean it. It's not just Moon and June lyrics and stuff like that. You can write that starting out, but Look at your favorite artists and figure out how did they get there? What, I mean, how much time did it take? It's not an overnight thing. It takes a while. Like you said, we didn't have gadgets and stuff. We practiced in the room or listened to music. There's a lot more distractions now, so you have a little bit 
more difficult time now in this generation because everybody's got the box and is addicted to the box and all the communications and everything go through that. But you need to spend time with your instrument or at the piano or guitar writing music wherever you write it. And you're going to write a, a thousand songs to get one good one. And then that's, your odds will change. It will get better. You got to be able to take a punch and you have to have skin so thick there's no muscle tissue. It's just skin. <laughs> you have to, you know, that's really the best advice I could say. Don't take no for an answer because they said no to me. I had to do it. I was going to die trying. I wasn't going to do what I was supposed to fall back on in case. And if it doesn't work out, you figure it out. Otherwise, you're going to spend the rest of your life hating yourself for not going for it. Yeah, 100%. Well said, Mr. Steve Lukather. Amazing. Sage Jim Keltner. What would you say to them as a sage? What would you give them the kind of advice, Jim, that you'd lay on them? Man, I mean, after all of that, I, I, think, uh, I think that's the key. The, the key is that you, you, if you love, if you're here uh, and you, you play music, or even if you just love music and you don't play, uh, to me, it's, it, that really is the key. Uh, uh, you know, they, they used to say, somebody asked me, they said uh, the other day, uh, do you have faith in yourself? And, uh, and I said, uh, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think I do. Um, but like, I have a big faith. I, ha I have a real big faith in, in God. And, and, uh, and, and I, told, I promised my wife I would not go do, you know, get religious on you and everything. But I, uh, I feel that everything that is good that has happened in my life has been because of my faith, through my faith. Uh, that I, uh, you know, and so I, I think it's good to, to have faith in yourself. Uh, I think that's what God wants us to do, is to have faith in ourselves. You know, if you're asking just me, right, you've got all this other brilliant uh, information from these guys, and these guys are experienced and they know exactly what they're talking about. For me, I would just echo that, and I would say that um, when I was five years old, my mama showed me how to pray, because I was afraid of the dark. And I said that little prayer that she told me to do, and I got home safe that night, and I thought, okay, that's, that's what I gotta do. And that's the truth, so I've been praying all my life. And I can just only tell you that I think maybe that does make a big difference somewhere in there, you know. But, but truly, uh, just love, you know, love uh, your instruments, love you. I keep wanting to talk to the drummer. Uh, when I was 13, that's when I started. And so apparently, uh, this, this yeah. person, this 13-year-old drummer is like killing already at 13, right? Yeah. <laughs> that is a gift straight to you. Nobody else has that gift, and that's so incredible. Just really realize that. Just make sure you understand that and nurture that gift, and hopefully to God, somewhere along the way, you don't try to kill it. Like, I don't think that Lee, I think Lee was, was the better of the three of us here. <laughs> us two, we did things that we, would, we were trying to kill it, and, and we didn't know in our defense. <laughs> Oh, I know. I know. He knew. I don't. But, but the thing I've is, I've always uh, been the designated driver. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I swear to God, that's the truth, man. Yeah. So, so you know, understand that you are gifted, no matter. And there's all kinds of levels of gifts too, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. you don't have to be like they already said it. You know, you don't have to to be the the top dog. Just just be one of the dogs. You know. I mean, just just understand that you have. Uh, you have a, a, a brilliant gift, each one of you. Uh, that's, uh, I, I, I can't stress that enough. And, and no matter what level you are at your playing or your writing, you know, your, your writing, and everything, just like he said, write every day. You gotta do it. You, you gotta play every day. I mean, you don't gotta, but if you love it, that's what you're gonna do. And that's what's gonna take you where you wanna go. Jim Kellner. <laughs> Beautiful. We have some closing thoughts. 
Many years ago, we've all been doing this in the music industry for many, many years. The fountain of youth. In my travels around the world, I found the fountain of youth. The fountain of youth for me is to constantly be a student. Open your mind up to learn. Take every day in with that level of learning. You will be excited. You will be young for the rest of your life. Many years ago, Neil Sedaka wrote a song called The Hungry Years. I missed the hungry years. It was one of the lines. I played I on too, it. I too. Lee, Lee played on it. What I love about that song is the fact that you are now in your hungry years. You're going to miss them someday. Enjoy the moment that you're at because this is the greatest point of your life. Understand the responsibility to your talent. A great teacher of mine, Shelley Mann, many years ago in 1976, in my first lesson, came on and wrote on the board the word imagination. Understand that word. Use that word with your life and your career. We ask only one thing of all of you right now, because you are the future of the music business. NAMM has been around for over 100 years. We do this every year. You are the future of the music industry. You will move this forward. We believe in you. We want you to be successful, but we ask of only one thing from you. Prove us right. Prove us right that you can go out and move this industry forward, create great music, improve the level of humanity, and make this world a better place. Thank you so much on behalf of the sessions, guys. Dom Famular here at the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.